The information and tips on this show is not intended as a substitute for personal medical advice. Before making any decision regarding your health, please consult a physician or other qualified health care practitioner. Hello and welcome to African American Health Matters. Well, African American Health Matters is a new mobile health text message and multimedia outreach that gives health tips and reminders to our subscribers right over their cell phones. Yes, it actually gives them their health tips for things like remembering to take your medication, tips on handling diabetes, hypertension, losing weight, and also breaking all those bad habits. Now, you can register online and get health text messages on your cell phone by going to www.AfricanAmericanHealthMatters.com or you can call our 800 number, which is 1-800-677-8441. That's 1-800-677-8441. 8441 and somebody will get back to you probably within 24 hours to get you registered. Now you know African American Health Matters kicked off a little over a year ago as part of the National Physician and Family Referral Project. It's known as NPFR and it is a division of 50 hoops. Well there are critical numbers of African Americans dying from prostate, breast, lung and colon cancer but a lot of times it's treated too late. Now, even more African Americans are affected by diabetes, hypertension, asthma, high cholesterol, obesity, drugs, and alcohol. And we're still needing continuing education and more information about HIV and AIDS. Our surveys show that we need more ways to access resources available in our community. Yes, and Papa, do you know what? There's a staggering number of African Americans who are not aware of drug discoveries that could save their lives through clinical trials. What we need to do is educate more people about the importance of clinical trials. I agree completely. And the only way to do this is to participate in new drug discoveries. Now, Ed, you know, racial disparities in health care for African Americans and other minorities, including underserved, is very high. And that's why we're so happy to have great partners with, within our African American Health Matters. You're absolutely right. And each week we want to recognize and thank all of them. Elise Cook, uh, she is Associate Professor in the Department of Clinical Cancer Prevention at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. She's board certified family physician specializing in cancer prevention of the institution's Cancer Prevention Center, the CPC. Really, really good about Dr. Cook is the fact that she has a couple of interests that are right on point for this show. One of those is minority recruitment and retention into clinical trials, and the other is cancer health disparities. So hello, Dr. Cook, and we're very happy to have you here. Dr. Cook, give us an example of a clinical trial with good minority participation. Well, um, I'd like to give you um, uh, the the example of the SELECT trial. This is a trial that's uh, completed its active uh, participation, and now the participants are um, followed in a central location, and they're being followed by mail only. Mm -hmm. And... um, this trial was conducted between 2001 and they went on for seven years. Mm-hmm. Um, these participants, uh, the trial was to look at selenium and vitamin E, mm-hmm. yes. select trial, to okay. see if they could prevent prostate cancer, mm-hmm. either one of these agents in combination or alone. Mm-hmm. And this also included a placebo arm, so there were four arms to the trial. Mm-hmm. The men took these study agents every day and then we conducted interim analysis, and this is one of the safety uh, nets we have in studies to see if there's a problem with the study, should it continue to go on, yes. and we had a data safety and monitoring board, which are very common with large trials. By the way, this trial had 35,000 men in wow. the United States, Canada, and Puerto Rico, wow. and over 400 sites. Um, so with these large trials, these boards uh, do uh, meet, and they evaluate the study, and they determined that it uh, was not, it did, the agents did not work, mm-hmm. and uh, 
that it was futile for us to continue with the trial. The trial was scheduled to go on for 12 years. So we ended that phase of the trial mm -hmm. with the uh, participants taking study drugs. This trial showed several uh, things about clinical trials. Number one, taking a placebo is not always a bad thing. Okay. In this trial, if you took the placebo, you actually had the better agent because the selenium was found to increase uh, diabetes, huh. uh, but it was non-statistically significant, hmm. but there was an increase in diabetes onset in the men who took the selenium. Hmm. In the vitamin E, the men who uh, took the vitamin E had more, had more cases of prostate cancer than the men who didn't. Wow. So the men who took nothing actually did better, who took hmm. no um, study supplement did better, the ones who were on placebo. Now you'd think, well, gee whiz, well, how did they pick these agents? They had very uh, reasonable rationale for, for picking these agents uh, by virtue of looking at a secondary analysis from other studies. One study showed a 60% risk reduction of prostate cancer in men who took selenium for preventing skin cancer, and the other trial uh, had a 40% risk reduction of prostate cancer in men who were taking vitamin E for lung cancer. Wow. And so it looked like, it, okay, if we conduct a, a true head-to-head -head study and, mm -hmm. and looked at um, these agents as a, a primary endpoint, then we could see if this was real, if this finding mm -hmm. was real, and the finding was not real. Oh. Okay. So that is... Um, that is an example mm -hmm. of a clinical trial that was, it was useful in that a lot of men were taking vitamin E for their prostate mm -hmm. before the study was done. And now we have the evidence to say, mm -hmm. stop, don't yeah. do that. Uh, so that's the, the, the a trial that was a null study, mm -hmm. meaning because none of the problems were statistically significant, we can't say there was definite harm. Mm -hmm. So meaning no harm, but no definitely no benefit mm -hmm. to either agent gave us useful information. That is very that's useful. Amazing. Yeah. The doctor now... What have you found during your clinical trial research is the best way to access African Americans to get them into clinical trials? Um, it, it really depends and, you know, I just completed a, a research plan for a recruitment plan for minorities for a study that's just been put on hold. So we have all these issues that come up with these studies and it was for a treatment trial. It's very different to access participants for a treatment trial than it is for a screening trial. For a treatment trial, you need to access patients who have a disease. Mm -hmm. And I work at a cancer hospital, so ours are cancer patients. Right. So we either have to go to surgeons or we have to go to medical oncologists or primary care doctors mm -hmm. to access these patients. Mm -hmm. The other thing we need to do is to make sure patients are aware of clinical trials. Right, and right. know how to access them Absolutely. themselves if they get diagnosed with a cancer or any problem really. Um, the, the other type of recruitment is for prevention trials, and mm -hmm. prevention trial recruitment is very different. Mm -hmm. You're looking at the general population, and that's when you use media, whatever fits your, uh, your environment. Mm -hmm. For some uh, locations, uh, churches and, uh, work fine, they work great, and others, they, they're dismal. Uh, so mm -hmm. you have to know your community and what works in that specific community. Mm -hmm. But mail order works great. Um, health fairs have not been proven to uh, be that beneficial. We definitely didn't have good success with those at the, in the select trial, and that was a very large uh, trial. Mm -hmm. uh, we found that giving money to sites to enhance minority recruitment worked very well. Okay, that's good if to know. sites that are, have access, Mm -hmm. and ability mm -hmm. to recruit minorities, and mm -hmm. they're given extra funding to do just that, okay. then you will see a benefit. The other thing about closing, some trials have done this. They close the trial when they get to a certain point for everyone but the minority. They're mm -hmm. Yeah, I've so heard that of that. they can get enough minorities exactly. into the trial. Sure. Mm -hmm. Those are, it, it's, it's very hard to get the investigators who are designing the trials and those who are uh, leading the study mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah. Um, but um, and sometimes the funding agency doesn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to do that. So you have to start on the ground running. You have to mm -hmm. start with minority recruitment 
beginning of the yes, child absolutely. observation. Yes. And what happens in most cases is that that doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, the trial starts, and then mm-hmm. uh, you, you look at the numbers, and, and national, you're looking at the numbers, and you say, gosh, I don't have enough African Americans, mm-hmm. so let's develop a plan. By then, your study is already ramped up. That's right. You have tons of uh, white uh uh, men or women or both coming that's, into the trial, that's right. and you don't, you know, you, it's very hard to to get to the percentages that you need to get to mm-hmm. when you have a shortened mm-hmm. uh, recruitment time that's for right. uh, a, a, a plan, mm-hmm. a strategy. That is right. You're absolutely right. So, I mean, we've seen that happen. We do. It's happened over and over All again. the and time. Try to... It, try to um, make a difference with that and what what happens when you do try to make a difference with that is uh is something that i do and what i what i come up against and this isn't a problem it's just part of being on the cutting edge Mm -hmm. is that you wind up talking to large minority organizations like the national medical association Mm -hmm. or the national hispanic medical association Mm -hmm. about a trial and then the trial doesn't get started for some reason or another. Yes. Or the trial never gets. This is cutting edge stuff, so that's going to happen. It's higher risk. It is but higher that's risk. How, the only way you can get on the ground running is if you let folks know about a trial before it starts. The big, if it's a big, important trial, you should do that, yeah. attempting to increase minority participation in clinical trials. Yeah, just as an aside, one of the things that we do in our company is recruit African Americans for clinical trials, and you're absolutely right. We have gone into diabetes trials that are 24 months long, and it's like down to the last six months before they actually want to start recruiting African Americans, and I think it's the sponsor that needs to put that priority on here. Exactly, and the other thing is, Whenever you submit a grant proposal to the federal government, you have to list percentages yeah. of um, minorities, and, and you have to list all of them and, yeah. and how many you plan to accrue. And if you don't meet those numbers, then you you know didn't you didn't meet your numbers, right. and so they're trying to meet their numbers. And I wish they would apply that to the private industry. They're not playing by the same rules, and I don't think that that I mean there should be some sort of a requirement that they have to have an X number of African Americans. But the large farmers they don't go by the same rules, and we don't exactly. know what has most, to happen. Most drug, uh, drugs are. Uh, studied outside of this country. That's right. That's because right. They, they claim that this population, the American population, is a saturated in form of treatment. Mm. It's hard to find somebody with high blood pressure who's not on treatment or has no. cholesterol who's no. not taking medicine. So it's hard for them to conduct their trials in this country. But what happens is, it's even worse that they go to some countries and they have these unique diseases and, mm-hmm. and are unique side effects. That's I've right. I've heard of in some countries where there's one particular drug um, that had a unique uh, liver disorder mm-hmm. that occurred from the population taking the drug, and mm-hmm. this was some, some um, Asian country. Wow. And so this one unique population that can skew all your trials. That's exactly right. That's right. exactly right. And they eat an cont- entirely different diet. And we do. They That's right. Dinner. That's right. It's a different, um, and they have different stressors, different em- environment, mm-hmm. uh, pollutants, and mm-hmm. things like that. So mm-hmm. you can't, it's not uh, apples and oranges. No, it's I mean, not. It is apples and oranges. I wish there was something that we could do to make that change. To re- I wish it was some way we could require the, the sponsors, these huge companies that are spending billions of dollars around the world, and we have untapped populations of African Americans, Hispanics, and Asians are not being, because they don't want to put the, a, a little extra time into, first of all, putting it up front and making it a priority, and secondly, to do the tiny bit of extra work it may you know, take to educate to get them in. And well, you know, there's another thing that's an issue with these conducting these trials overseas. If a physician in some countries, they actually make a lot of money by participating in these trials. Mm-hmm. Whereas folks in this country may not make any money; they mm-hmm. may lose money by yeah. participating in clinical trials yeah. because the payment. Uh, for a clinical trial overseas, it may not even be what they pay here, mm-hmm. but it is so much more than they get from mm-hmm. just regular patient care yeah. that they're eager to participate yeah. in clinical trials and yeah. generate numbers. Yeah. 
so they can get their numbers so much easier overseas mm-hmm. than they can here. Well, we're going to get into that a little later. I'm going to move back into it. It's true. As African Americans, we have the highest risk of being diagnosed with colon cancer. The good news is that this is a cancer we can do something about. Find out the facts. Talk to your doctor about getting a screening test starting at age 45. Learn more by visiting the Colon Cancer Alliance at www.screenmycolon.com or by calling 877-422-2030. That's 877-422-2030. Here's some news and information for today's program. People should take advantage of federally qualified health centers to receive primary health care at Preventive Health Services. Go to www.hrsa.gov, and if you don't have Internet access, call your local health department. Here's some information and news about sarcoidosis. I know we've had several celebrities to pass away as a result of the complication of sarcoidosis, but uh, sarcoidosis involves inflammation that produces tiny lumps of cells in organs throughout the body. Uh, It says the lumps look like grains of sugar or sand and can grow and clump together and affect how an organ works. There's no official cause or cure for the disease and people between 20 and 40 are typically diagnosed with the disease. Pneumonia is often a, co- a major complication of sarcoidosis. Some symptoms are coughing, shortness of breath, uh, vague chest pains or exertion. Uh, it can occur in almost any part of the body, but the most common areas are lungs, lymph nodes, eyes, and liver. And this is really some good information that we should have right now. Kidney diseases make up a very large part of the overall health care effort because about one in nine adults has some kind of chronic kidney disease, and it's something everybody should be aware of. Our next guest is Dory Chattel, Executive Director of the Medical Education Institute. She's here to talk about it. Dory, welcome aboard. Hi, Dennis. How are you? I'm doing really good. One in nine, that's an interesting statistic. I suggest people should be staying aware. How can people know about their own kidney health? It would be a great idea if they get their blood pressure checked and if they get a regular chemistry panel done when they have their physical and if their creatinine level is good and their blood pressure is good and if they don't have any protein in their urine, probably their kidneys are okay. But you can have kidney disease without symptoms, so it's good to have that checked periodically. Now, in case of kidney failure, dialysis is very often the solution to serious kidney disease, but apparently dialysis isn't just one thing anymore. Explain to me the variety of approaches that are now in this field. Well, there there are two main types of dialysis. One type is called peritoneal dialysis, where you actually use the lining of the inside of your abdomen as a filter to clean the blood. A surgeon puts a tube in through your belly or your chest going down into your belly, and you fill up that sort of sac that's inside your belly with a sterile fluid, the waste and water flow into it, and then you drain it out again, and you put in fresh fluid. Do that a few times a day, and it will clean your blood for you. So um, most people don't know about that type, even though it's been around since the 80s. I assume you're not able to do the hemodialysis at home. Oh, but you can. Lots of people do. Hemodialysis can be done at home on a couple of different schedules, both of which are better than the typical one of going to a center three times a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, or Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and doing, say, a three- or four-hour treatment. Since your kidneys work 24-7, the closer you can get to doing treatment 24-7, the better you feel. So when you do hemodialysis at home, you get training, and with a partner to help you, you can do dialysis either every day, say five to seven days a week for two or three hours, and you can do that in the morning, you can do it at night, you can do it whenever it's convenient, or you can even do dialysis while you sleep at night. So you get eight hours of treatment, you know, four to seven days a week, usually four to six, and that's about the most dialysis anybody can get, and folks who do more dialysis feel better, live longer. Dory, that's remarkable. I didn't know there were that many options available these days. Thanks for joining us and bringing us up to date. You are very welcome. Dory Chattel is Executive Director of the Medical Education Institute. We reached her by phone at her office in Madison, Wisconsin. There's a whole lot more to learn on the web at www.homedialysis.org. Here's one of our mobile tips. Here's one on hypertension. Five ways to cut salt. Know your daily salt allowance. Rinse canned foods. Eat in, eat fresh, and read labels. This comes from John Hopkins Health Alert. Okay. Here's one entitled Heart, 
30, 300, 3,000. For your heart, remember less than 30% fat, 300 milligrams of cholesterol, and no more than 3,000 milligrams of sodium. This comes from www.fi.edu. Here's one on heart palpitations. A study by Mayo Clinic found that blacks are less likely than whites to know that they have atrial fibrillation. Okay. Lung cancer. Did you know that black men are hardest hit by lung cancer? Don't be a statistic. This comes from our partner, the American Lung Association, and their website is www.lungusa.org. Here's one on fighting gravity. Gravity is important in keeping acid out of the esophagus. Keep your posture upright, especially after eating for proper digestion. This comes from www.lifescript.com. Ronnie Whitfield's rap on raising awareness about heart disease. You can see the video by going to www.cyberstationusa.com slash AAHM and click Let's Go. While her friend Cheryl bravely fought for her life, Nancy, with help from the Virginia Task Force for Insurance Reform, 
worked on reforming coverage for cancer patients. In 1994, the task force was victorious with the passage of Virginia House Bill 240. But Nancy didn't stop there. She founded the Patient Advocate Foundation. All of these cases involve patients with chronic, life-threatening, or debilitating conditions. Some need help taking on their insurance company. Others have no insurance, while others have coverage but need financial assistance to buy medicine. None of these clients will ever have to pay for the help they receive from the Patient Advocate Foundation. And the foundation is able to successfully resolve more than 98% of the cases it takes on. Well, when patients call PAF, um, oftentimes they have a myriad of issues that they're faced with. What they can expect from us is comprehensive, individualized services um, designed to help with their immediate need and also identify future needs that they may have as they move through illness uh, back into good health. Um, our case managers are highly trained, they have diverse backgrounds, and when a patient calls our 1-800 number, they're immediately connected to a live case manager. The case manager does an initial assessment of their needs, we fill in an intake form um, where we capture all data necessary to work their case, and then that person, that case, is assigned out to a, a case manager based on area of specialty that will work with that patient from initial intake through full resolution. When people call us, they're desperate. Every avenue available to them to solve the problem has not worked, and it's their life that they're fighting for. And at the end of the day, you're gonna to battle to save your life medically, but we don't want you to have to battle to save your life financially and to feel that you're losing all of your integrity and your hope because you can't get the financial issues solved or an insurance issue solved. We can do that for you. It's very important that the people in this country realize this organization exists and that they know how to get to them, how to contact them, and get the help they need. For more information, please visit us at www.patientadvocate.org or call us at 1-800-532-5274. You can register online to receive health text messages by going to www.africanamericanhealthmatters.com or you can call at 1-800-677-8441 and someone will get back with you within 24 hours to get you registered. We want to thank our physicians, speakers, and guests for joining us on Cyber Station USA be sure to tune in on Fridays from noon to 1 to African American Health Matters on Cyber Station USA.